Right. Well, welcome aboard uh, today for our Creo uh, collaborative, collective collaborative conversation around incarnational impulse and ministry uh, in the local uh, community setting. And I'm really excited to have a number of practitioners who are not just theoreticians, but actually practitioners. Uh, in real time. So Mike and I were super excited when we looked at the schedule and saw this coming up. I've got uh, my new friend, uh, Charlie, uh, is it Dever or Deaver? Uh, Deaver. 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 Yes. Like the suit wearing cat at Capital C City Baptist, huh? Any relation? No, is, it, is that, does he, I think he says Dever, does he not? Does he? Okay. Well, you're probably right, Charlie. So I, I was going to say to differentiate myself from, <laughs> um, no, no relation, no, no relation whatsoever. So, okay. I'm, I'm getting Charlie's info up here. I asked him for a little bit of, uh, introductory material. So I'm going to pray for us and we're going to dive right in after I give us some, uh, contours for our conversation today. And uh, we'll get started. So, Father, thank you for bringing my friends and I together uh, in your presence. Thank you for the gift of technology. Thank you that we can tune in, be part of what you're doing from all corners uh, of this country. God, we're grateful for how you've swept us up in the story of your restoration and reconciliation of all things made possible through Jesus and the gospel. Thank you for the, the folks who are going to be presenting today. Thank you for Charlie. Um, looking forward to hearing his story and how you have um, uniquely gifted him um, and given him a calling to really walk in this impulse, this incarnational impulse that we're going to be discussing today. Thanks that he gets the chance to walk that out with my friend Aaron. I love that they're both on the call today and maybe we'll even get up maybe some uh, back and forth between the two of them. Help us to be attentive to what your spirit is speaking uh, and I pray that each of us would uh, be graced with wisdom and revelation from heaven, that we might love those who you love that surround us who don't yet know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, my friend Charlie, who I had uh, just a great conversation with recently, uh, love him, love his heart for the ministry. So he's an East Coaster. Uh, we discovered in the pre-meeting, the brief beforehand in the green room, that he's from originally from Westchester, Pennsylvania. I didn't realize anything as uh, anointed as himself came out of Westchester. So maybe he needs to talk a little bit about that. Uh, he's got his MDiv from the Free Church uh, Mothership at Trinity. So that means he's got a ring and he's part of the old boy network. He's got a lot of juice there. I don't know what that's going to get you, maybe two bucks and a coffee. But anyways, uh, got some, he's been married to his uh, sweetheart, Nicole, for seven years. Got two beautiful girls, Nora and Isabel, four and one. And most uh, interestingly, uh, he loves hiking, fly fishing, gardening, and evidently he's quite an accomplished uh, dancer. I've got a little notation here. He likes to uh, to dance, so maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that later. Uh, move to said specifically dance with my girls. Well, I was going to clarify dance. that, man. <laughs> I was creating mystery, man. I was creating mystery and anticipation. <laughs> so he is in Knoxville, moved there three years ago uh, to plant a church called Hope. And um, he and I had some. Uh, conversation around some questions uh, that I had for him uh, as he prepared for the seminar today as our uh, our keynoter, for lack of a better phrase. And I didn't realize that Aaron was going to be on the call, but in the providence of God, I misspoke myself. And, and here he is, GQ, with a beard. So maybe between he and Charlie, uh, maybe Charlie can lead out and Aaron can bounce back and forth, tell us a little bit about what God's doing there in Knoxville as they incarnate more of the gospel. And we'll do this in our traditional format. I'll continue to let people in. We'll go about first 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have a robust time of conversation and dialogue at the end. Cool? All right, let's dive in. Charlie, it's all yours. Yeah, 
thanks Foy. Appreciate it. Well, I'm honored to be on this call with you all. And um, I've, uh, I've gotten to know uh, through Aaron about Creo over the years. Oddly enough, never heard about him my time at Trinity. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I uh, got to sit in on a two day, I think it was last, it's probably about a year ago. Not exactly sure when we had it here in Knoxville and got to hear Vo Foy talk and, and got to meet Mike and um, was really encouraged. It's really cool that there's a, a group like this of people that are living this out and, and encouraging one another, sharing stories. And we definitely, definitely need this. So um, yeah, Foy uh, introduced me a little bit. I spent most of my formative years in Chicago. That was where I kind of grew up, but um, was born in Westchester, Pennsylvania to two, two parents that were very uh, de-churched. One was a recovering Catholic and the other, uh, my dad just never, never was in church growing up. And uh, my mom's parents, um, who are wonderful, wonderful Catholic people, they insisted that um, my parents baptize me when I was a kid. And uh, that wasn't an option in the Catholic church. So my parents were, were going to different churches and they, they found a Presbyterian church in, uh, in uh, I think it was in media, uh, PA, that would, uh, would baptize us. But the, the pastor found out that my parents were um, pub musicians, like they'd perform together in bars. And so he said, if you lead worship one Sunday, you can baptize, you, I'll baptize your kids. At the time, I had a younger brother. It was a crazy story. I can't can't even imagine that it's true, but it happened. And my dad was the first one to ever play guitar in in that Presbyterian church. And uh, and he told me tells me that after after that service, someone came up to me. He's like, you know, that's the devil's instrument. So um, so I don't I I don't know how they stuck around. Uh, but my parents were immersed in church life from that point on. They, they got involved in the, the young adults ministry in the Presbyterian church. And then we moved to Rhode Island and my mom was hired on as a worship pastor at a church. And she claims that she had still not uh, committed her life to Christ at that point. She was kind of faking it. Um, so she was leading worship at this covenant church in uh, East Greenwich, Rhode Island for years before she, she found Jesus. Um, and, uh, but I, I really attribute, you know, those early years to a lot of the ways I think about church and seeing my parents kind of figure this out, being un, an unchurched father and a de-churched mom and, um, seeing them kind of engage in these, these communities and deal with the mess, but also, um, there's just a lot of excitement and, uh, authenticity to the, the faith, uh, growing up. Um, then we moved to Chicago and my mom took another role as a worship pastor there in Chicago. And, uh, it kind of all fell apart, um, uh, at that point. And we, we, it was a pretty messy situation there at that church. And so that's when we were first, at least I was first aware of the, the real brokenness that can happen in, in, uh, church communities. And, um, you know, my parents, we ended up leaving that church and, and, uh, my, they're both involved in ministry now, but it was about 15 years before they, they were willing to step back into official ministry. Um, so, uh, but grew up in a, in a real healthy, uh, church plant, um, in the Chicago area after that whole experience. And yeah, I remember, um, I, I was, we would go on, my dad helped start a mission organization with a musician in Nicaragua, and we would go every summer to Nicaragua. And I remember uh, for a long time feeling like God was calling me to be a missionary, overseas missionary. And that was kind of my, you know, what I always thought I'd end up doing. And then reality struck and I decided I bet probably should get a real job. And, you know, I decided to uh, become a chiropractor. So I was going to college and Michigan State was pursuing chiropractic. I graduated from Michigan State, was heading to chiropractic school, and was sitting in church with with my fiance, soon to be wife. And yeah, just the spirit hit us, and we really felt we didn't know what it looked like, but we really felt God calling us into 
local church ministry, which was odd at the time because we, uh, we had just, we had met in parachurch ministry and we were getting pretty frustrated coming out of college, being in a parachurch ministry that was so focused on discipleship and mission and then coming to the local church and not finding one person that, that even knew what it meant when we asked, would you disciple us <laughs> and not seeing a whole lot of mission either. Uh, but for whatever reason, we both were like, no, God's not calling us to parachurch campus ministry. He's calling us to the local church ministry. And so I was 20 minutes down the road from Trinity. So naturally I, I checked out Trinity. I had no other connection to it otherwise and ended up at, at Trinity getting my master's. Um, throughout that process, got interested in church planting, uh, took a job at, at my home church as the young adults pastor. It was a very, it's a, it is a very high production, you know, Sunday centric church. They're doing a lot of wonderful uh, missional things now. Uh, it's where I was first exposed to Forge, which we're affiliated with Forge. There was a guy who came in and did some training and consulting from Forge at our church. So there was some missional conversation going on, but the, the bulk of the effort and energy was spent on putting on this Sunday, wonderful, uh, wonderful Sunday service um, that was really geared towards the young community that we existed in. Uh, oddly enough, it didn't seem like any of the young people were really interested in what we were putting on. So I would have all these young adult friends and, uh, you know, try to get them to Sunday morning and they may come, they may not, but if they did come, they, they were, no matter how cool they thought it was, no one really had any interest in coming back, but then we'd go and sit around a bonfire and drink and smoke and talk about Jesus for hours. Um, and I was just, I began to, to ask, like, why are we doing all these things, spending all this money and try, trying to do this, this, this um, Sunday morning uh, experience, try to create this experience that is, doesn't matter how good we do it. There's this, this whole bunch of people on the outside that will never come in or will never stick around. But those same people, uh, it's not that they don't want to talk about Jesus. It's not that they don't want to have real, authentic, meaningful relationships. It's not that they don't want to be a part of something that makes their community, their neighborhood a better place. You know, it's not that they want to be involved in some sort of mission. Um, they're just not into this experience. And so that started to get me to ask a lot of questions as I was pursuing church planting. Um, and it kind of, it kind of messed me up a little bit because in the pursuit of church planting, it was all about, you know, this launch service, it's gotta be good. You gotta have a bunch of people there. And, and it's, you know, it's all about that one launch and came to, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. It was, it was kind of a long story, but it's where we felt like God calling us. And, um, we're still asking a lot of these questions and, uh, met some, some people early on, including Aaron Loy and, it really stretched my understanding of what this could look like. And so we began pursuing um, more of a decentralized family of house churches uh, here in Knoxville that were community led, um, started and centered around joining Jesus on mission. Um, and so, so we, we really focus on uh, we, we really intentionally don't, don't make a lot of space for um uh, people to, to kind of just come, come and sit around, consume church. We, we have space for missionaries and space for, uh, unchurched and de-churched people. And, um, you know, that's, that's by design. So, so we're doing that. That's, that's kind of how hope looks, um, and, and where we're at there, but all along the way, I've been on a journey myself. So I don't know, Foy, do you have specific questions that you'd like to guide me from here? Or you want me to just keep going? Yeah, uh, I love that. That was fantastic. What was that last thing you said? We we make space for missionaries and for unchurched and de churched. Yeah. People. So so the, what we say is we we want to make space for people to to pursue Jesus who would never step through the doors of a church on Sunday morning. So that's what we're about. And in order to do that, you gotta have some missionaries and real real you know people that are really committed to creating that space. So yeah. Uh, can you so, talk a little, 
Can you talk a little bit, Charlie, about how you move people into a place of training so they can transition out, be deployed on the field and what that looks like there in Knoxville? And I'm assuming at some point Aaron's going to intersect the story and we can have him speak in it too, as you guys platoon up. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'd love for Aaron to chime in. I'm learning a lot from Aaron, by the way. He's He's been a, a lifesaver over the years. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have, we have a six month uh, training, we call it missionary training, um, that we take people through right now we have a group of nine going through it it's our third round of it in the last two, two plus years. Um, and this by far is, is the best group we've had as far as just being committed to it and really uh, they, we're on week two and the stories that we're already having uh, people sharing every week are just, just wonderful. And we not, not something we have in the first two rounds. So, you know, that is our main thing. I mean, as far as like what we have to offer people, you know, we have the house churches, we have a, a corporate worship gathering that looks different week to week, but it's a space for kind of the leaders to be filled up and encouraged and uh, light training. We're not really, you know, it's, it's real centered around scripture and prayer and discernment. Um, and then we have this, this missionary train. That's a real intense, uh, thing, you know, it's 10, 10 sessions over about five to six months, um, real actionable, uh, uh, assignments week to week, some reading, some podcast listening, uh, lots of about two hours of discussion and a little bit of training and, uh, prayer and discernment. So, um, and, you know, what we, you know, pretty much tell people from, from the start when they get involved is, you know, if you're, if, if you're following Jesus and you want to be part of this community, like this is, this is what we're about. You know, this is our, this is our hope 101 membership class, you know, whatever, like it's, it, we don't have anything else. This is, this is the way to get engaged and, and grow in this community. And so, so that train has been huge. We've, we've uh, formulated that with help from Forge as well as, as Aaron and what, what they're doing at Commonwealth and just kind of shaped it um, uh, to, to cater specifically towards our community and, and the kind of the, the desired output of the training. And so we've done it a little bit different uh, every round. This third one, I think, is we're really uh, on to something now. but. Um, you know, we've had to make adjustments and change round to round, you know, based on the response and, and how it went. So I can, I can break that down if that's of interest, uh, that train a little bit more, but. Yeah, I think Charlie and maybe, you know, Aaron can speak to this too after you respond. With Creo, what we're trying to do is help move people from the theology and the th theoretical application yep. into actual missionary endeavor um, in real time, appreciable ways uh, with metrics that help us to acknowledge um, what it looks like to actually being uh, missionaries who are loving Jesus, loving one another and loving the lost or the pre-Christian people around us. And I know you come from kind of a traditional situation you come from the academy. What does this look like? What makes hope distinctive currently and as you guys think about platooning up you and Aaron that would differentiate you from say a uh, church like fellowship and I know you both uh, know Rick down there have relationship with him just pulling a name out of the air love fellowship church um, what's differentiating your missionaries moving outward in mission than a traditional Sunday centric programmatic model I'd be interested in hearing that Yeah. Um, so we, I, I think it's the, so, so, well, first, how do we use our Sundays? So we do gather every Sunday. I think um, that's important because I, I think a lot of times we have in our minds, like how this is a model and it looks a certain way. And that's just not true. Uh, we used to have uh, bi bi-weekly Sunday gatherings on Sunday evenings and uh, last Easter, just kind of based on where our community is, was at, we went to a Sunday, every, every Sunday morning gathering. Um, but, uh, 
you know, it's, we use those Sundays for different things. So sometimes it's, you know, prayer, discernment, worship, uh, sharing what God's put in our hearts. Some Sundays it's, uh, there might be a teaching and some worship. Um, once a month, we have a big communion meal, long table, potluck brunch, and, and celebrate communion together. But the purpose of that space is not, it's not a invitational space. Um, it's not a space where we're really inviting people in. It's a, a space where we're trying to fill up these people that are inviting others into their lives or entering into other people's lives all week long. Um, and uh, so, so I, I would say first and foremost, you know, it's, it's how you use the spaces you have um, is important. And then, and then who, and then the spaces that are for, you know, because there is, the, it's important that we send people out on mission but I also, you know, one of the things that we talk about is like we want to form communities around people on mission. Um, you know, community is really important. And we just have one-on-one -on -one missionaries everywhere. Um, you know, the people that we're discipling or taking on this journey are going to miss out on, on a really essential component, I think, to discipleship is which is community and really what makes it the church. So um you know, how do you go out as a group and invite people into a community uh, who are far from Jesus, far from the church, and then take them on this journey towards, towards what, what God might have for them and have for the community. And so, I mean, that's something that you mentioned, uh, Foy, how to, I think you mentioned like metrics or something like that, or how we measure success, sharing stories about how that's happening is, is our only way that we've found to successfully measure success. Cause we can't point to numbers. We can't even point to, uh, at this point, baptisms, um, you know, not to say that we wouldn't, we would love to baptize people, but, you know, we're taking people that are, are, uh, had no intention of ever engaging in church and, and bringing elements of, of the body of Christ around them. Um, so, I mean, I have, I have stories just to share about ways that we've done that. If, if you'd like me to do that, I know you would. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I can share personally how, how I've done it. Um, one, one way that's been a real success for us has been, uh, partnering with other local organizations that are not faith-based organizations. So one example of this and, you know, it's just kind of, you, you, you try things, if it works out, you keep doing it. If it doesn't, you don't. And one of the things that's worked out for us is, you know, my wife and I were vegan for a number of years. And so we got plugged into the Knoxville Vegan Club. And uh, as if, if you've ever met a group of vegans, you got a ton of, you got Wiccans in there, you got uh, all sorts of people um, that are uh, not, not necessarily uh, church of course there's some some believers in there as well but um it's a very diverse group of people uh and who wouldn't otherwise engage with a church community so we started doing uh share joint serving projects with knox vegan it started by us just cultivating a good relationship with the director of knox vegan but then we started doing these these uh she wanted to do some things in the community that so we started serving uh meals to people experiencing homelessness together and uh so every couple months we do and and we don't really promote it at all knox vegan does all the social media promotion they say knox vegan and hope knoxville are doing this thing together you know come be a part of it and it's been amazing the turnout that we've gotten and and there's been people uh who who have uh, come into our community fully through that. There's been people who have kind of dipped their toes uh, in the in the uh, the water um, of Hope Knoxville through that, uh, and and people that otherwise wouldn't, you know, like trans, you know, people that are transgender, people that uh, would have never, if if we put out something that said Hope Knoxville is doing this, they would not have come, been a part of it, but they're a part of this vegan club. Uh, that's kind of opens the door. We do something together. We build relationships. We invite them to other things, uh, realize, Hey, you live two blocks down the, down the street from us. We, we're doing this thing on Tuesday nights. Why don't you come have a meal with us? You know, things like that. Um, so that's been a great way to kind of mobilize the community together alongside other communities. Um, but uh, another way uh, that we've been doing this is just creating rhythms of uh of engagement 
based off of interests. So um, one guy in our community and he himself is on a journey. I think he's, he's really, he won't really say that he's a part of a church. He doesn't really, he's had a lot of hurt and, um, but he, he has, he's going through our missionary training right now. And he started a poets club on Sunday mornings in Knoxville. So he's a, he's a poet. Um, he, uh, invites other poets around, uh, a coffee at a coffee shop around the table and they share their poetry every Sunday. And so he's wrestling through faith crises that he's been through and all sorts of things and sharing that and having conversations. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's an opportunity for him to engage with people who will never come to a hope Knoxville, uh, program event you know, but they'll engage them in that way. And so right now what we're encouraging him to do is maybe, you know, find some other poets who love Jesus and invite them into that space too. So it's not you alone, uh, in that space. Um, I have, uh, last night we, we did this every Tuesday night. I got, um, two guys from hope and then about four or five guys from my block that come over from nine to midnight for cigars and beer, wine, whatever, whatever people have on hand. And so we just have a cigar night every Tuesday. Um, and some nights we talk about, you know, whatever, nothing, nothing that seems of value. There's the nights where we talked about what it means to be made in the image of God. And uh, other, other nights where we've, you know, we talk about Jesus and, you know, it just, it's, it's a really informal thing. And we've been doing it for a few months now. But what I keep helping these other two guys that are a part of this from hope with me, they're kind of co-missionaries in this is like, you know, we're not looking to have these crazy in-depth conversations today or tomorrow or next week. You know, we're looking six months down the road or a year down the road, or when one of these guys goes through a crisis in their life and they have nowhere to turn, but this group, and they know that every Tuesday they can come and they got guys that care for them. Uh, they know we love Jesus. They know they can ask questions. And what's it going to look like two years from now, if we have a group of 10, 10 guys, you know, most of whom, had no interest in, in faith, had no interest in the church. Uh, we're now meeting and talking about life and Jesus and, you know, and going on a journey of discipleship together. So it's slow. Um, and it requires persistent, uh, persistence and rhythms and patience. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of other stories like that. Nicole's got a similar group that's meeting on Wednesday nights. It's a, it's a, or I mean, Thursday nights. So Thursday night book club that doesn't read any books. They just drink wine. I guess, I don't know. <laughs> but a uh, similar thing. She's got a couple women from our community, a couple co-missionaries and then women from the neighborhood. Uh, and um, yeah, for Nicole and me personally, it's been all about our block. I mean, we just really start on our block. Once, once we've fully exhausted our relationships here on this block, we'll, we'll move beyond that, but we got a long way to go. I think. Awesome. I love yeah. that, man. Uh, I love how the Lord's fashioning one new man out of the barbecue king and the vegan man uh, laboring together. Right. I mean, that's glorious. There is hope for humanity uh, and the Republican Democratic yeah. divide can be transcended right there. That's right. We did a joint worship gathering, uh, Commonwealth and Hope this past Sunday. And Aaron, I don't think you, you know this, but when you, uh, you said at one point, some of us like to cook meat or whatever and some of us like to eat meat i'm like you got you got a few vegans in this hope knoxville group you, you're leaving out um <laughs> yeah i really need so, to work on my being all things to all people like inclusive that, man. the vegan Come wasn't on. even yeah it wasn't even like a category in my mind there's just the people yeah. who make the meat and the people who eat the meat that's, that's right Yep. <laughs> and, and then you said people that brew beer and people that drink beer. And luckily our Mormon family wasn't there, but they don't do that either. And they don't drink coffee. So that's going to be a <laughs> goodness, man. I'm out of moves. Yeah, you, 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 plumbed, you plumbed right. every trick you've got, Aaron. I love <laughs> how this demonstrates the differences in the shared and collaborative journey you guys are on. Aaron, uh, could you just speak to how you guys connected and how this is developing and you know, shared resources, you know, communities coming together for the transformation of Knoxville, particularly the places where God's put you guys. I think you're in South Knoxville. 
Charlie, where are you? You kind of West Knoxville or East Knoxville? East Knoxville. Yeah. East Knoxville. East, northeast, Northeast. But yeah, okay. East Knoxville is what we claim. Cool. That beard is looking phenomenal today too, by the way, Aaron. There are two people in the world, people with beards and people who want to have them. Make sure you uh, mention that, but uh, you might've found the ladies. Go, bro. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's actually fun to even catch up on some of this story because Charlie and I didn't set out to partner together. Um, that's, that's not how this went down. Um, had I known that he had gone to Trinity early on, you know, that would have been maybe a barrier uh, <laughs> not because I hate uh, Trinity or don't believe anything that they teach. I, I was actually, I'm a Trinity reject. I applied to go to Trinity Sem and was, <laughs> was rejected. Um, but yeah, you know, he's been doing his thing in East Knox. We've been doing our thing in South Knox and we got connected through a mutual friend and who essentially said like, do you know Charlie Deber? Like you guys need to be friends because uh, the vision that God's given you, some of the values that you're living out and what you're trying to do, like, align really well so and charlie and i started hanging out and that's exactly what we found um you know and and then uh yeah, yeah. i mean we essentially on the other side of of covid and i mean we we've been getting together for i don't know a couple of years now just to encourage one another right just be like you're not crazy or if you are crazy or you're not alone and you're crazy we're crazy too um stick with it it's worth it you know it's hard it's messy it's tempting to throw the big event thing and not do the very things that he's describing that they do. Um, we do very similar things. And then eventually just got to the point where like, why aren't we doing more partnering together? Um, what would it look like maybe to, to begin to come alongside, bring our communities alongside one another? And, and we're, we're, you know, we're doing similar things, but one of the fun things for me is we are, our communities are really different. Um, you know, we planted out of, out of mega church West Knoxville world. Um, and so the first two years was like heavy unlearning. Um, we do a six month residence, residency as well. And half of it is deconstruction. Um, Cause a lot of people, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard thing uh, to evaluate what's going on and, and ask some hard questions about, you know, what, what the church is currently doing and why it's not reaching any of our unbelieving friends. And then, uh, but Charlie, they're, they're younger than we are. Um, they're more, uh, I would say there's not as heavily church to backgrounds. And so one of the things that we kind of found along the way is like our community is really strong in some areas and they tend to be really different areas than Hope Knoxville is strong and, um, and vice versa. And so uh, we've, Charlie has been very complimentary that I continue to, to learn from Charlie and be deeply encouraged by him as we go. So, so we're very early in the process of beginning to bring our two works together and uh, excited to see what happens. But to answer your, I was gonna speak to this real quick for you. One of the things we've done um, is, you know, we, we have just refused to create or perpetuate environments that, that encourage passivity, you know, where, the, where participation is optional. Um, we had the luxury of not being big. And so being anonymous is not even an option. Um, and we've also made it kind of hard to even find your way into what I would describe as our core. Um, you know, we kind of took a play out of Hugh Halter's book and didn't put any gathering details like times or locations or anything like that on the website. Like the only way you find your way into Commonwealth is uh, through a microchurch or over, you know, a beer or coffee or breakfast. And what we found is like people who are hungry and curious, like they'll happily take you up on connecting. Um, and of course, those who find their way in through microchurches are already relationally connected. Uh, the only thing, like what's normative for them is the microchurch gathering. So there's no unlearning, relearning that has to take place. But man, there's a lot of, uh, we, f we found there's a lot of church people who will not take the first step uh, to personally connect. Like um, that is too big of a jump. And we just figured you know, like, if coffee is too big of a jump or shooting an email is just too big of a barrier, like we're probably not gonna jive. Like what we're gonna invite people into is, is gonna be a lot harder and messier than that. So mm. we just kind of end up weeding them out unintentionally with, with some of those things. Some of it's intentional, but. 
Yeah. Love that, Aaron. Thanks for sharing that. Um, two things. I, I find it amazing, perhaps as one of the older guys on this call, that you referred to Charlie's group as the younger crowd. You know, when we get together with you, I mean, those are those are younger people for some of us on this call. And you're like, Charlie's with the younger crowd. So I can't wait to get up there and hang out with them. That's fantastic. Charlie, uh, just before we finish up on the, the presentation piece and open up for com uh, conversation around questions, I've heard you use a phrase multiple times. It peaked my spiritual radar. And I want to ask you what it means. You talk about prayer and discernment. You use that phrase at least twice. What role, what does that mean to you guys at Hope? Mm. And how does that affect the trajectory of your ministry? And mm. you need to do that in about three and a half minutes. Go. Okay. <laughs> well, Just well, even. No, I appreciate uh, you, you asking. Um, I, you know, if I'm being, uh, I, I should be honest. I, um, it, it's prayer and discernment are not strengths of mine, you know, and, and, you know, of course I went to Trinity and then, you know, they sap it all out of you. <laughs> Actually, I'll take that back. I had some night, I had some wonderful uh, charismatic professors there, one or two, but uh, yeah, it's something that, um, I think out of desperation, I've had to grow in in the last three years as we've been here. Um, it's a strength of my mom's and a huge strength of hers. And um, so I've just been uh, trying to learn from people, like, how do I cultivate this in my own self? Uh, my wife is, is a prophetic, uh, prophetically gifted woman uh, who has a whole a lot of discernment which can frustrate me at times. And, um, but it's a huge blessing. And uh, so we've been trying to, in our community, really create space where the prophets uh, and the prayer warriors and the discerners are, are elevated. Uh, whereas typically, you know, you have the teachers that are elevated and um, you know, it, it can be awkward at times, but the more we've done it, the more we've, um, been able to enter into unguided prayer times and and just trust that the spirit's going to lead and people are going to share as as God places something on their hearts and um, you know we've just had to really be intentional about this is something that we need and uh, we'll, we're going to embrace the awkwardness of it um, and uh, there's certainly been some awkward moments where we spend you know going to a time of prayer and it's like no one has anything uh, but as we've done it more and more, those that do hear from God uh, regularly and those that don't but uh, have, have grown in that area have, have had more to um, uh, share with the community, to bless the community. So, yeah, I mean, generally it's a I might give a prompt um, and we'll go in a, to a time I, I like giving, you know, a extended time of just no one's going to pray out loud. No one's going to say anything out loud here for 10 minutes. We're just going to spend time maybe mulling over this Psalm, uh, just hearing from God, writing something down and then opening it up to either someone wants to share, someone wants to give, give a word, someone wants to pray. Um, and that gives people space to like, you know, kind of formulate something and, and actually listen to God. We try to jump too quickly to, to speaking. So I, I don't know if that answers your question. Um, we certainly don't, we could, we could, uh, we don't have a whole lot of structure for it, which maybe is a good thing. Um, we could certainly grow. I, I, I actually, I have on my notes to listen to the talk that you gave at Commonwealth for about hearing from God, um, because I think that'd be really helpful for our community to, to hear that, what you had to say. And Aaron said it was just wonderful. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's just something that we've just had to say, this is important and we're going to prioritize space for this, whether or not it produces what we want to produce immediately. And it's, and it's been, it's paid off. It's been worth it. So. Awesome. Hey man, thanks. I just love your heart. Um, I love how in Creo we're connecting people who are missional with her prayer and prophetic folks and prayer and prophetic folks with missionaries um, who are committed to incarnational impulse and i think in the marriage of the two we find the fullness of god's favor and increase and restoration so 
this has just been a robust conversation today. So three big takeaways for those people who are, are going to tune this later, tune into this later. In terms of harnessing incarnational impulse for the transformation of our cities, beginning in our own homes and neighborhoods, this is what I heard you say, Charlie. So these are my big three. Uh, partner with other organizations that are not faith-based uh, mm -hmm. to benefit the city, the welfare of the city. Secondarily, find places that are uh, uh, points of passion for you. Create affinity-based relationships that can be uh, gospel vehicles as God's spirit leads and then pursue people on your block. I mean, that's that was worth the price of admission today, man. Thanks yeah. very much. Appreciate yeah. your time. You know, I could add uh, just doing things together. Like, you know, the one of the things that's been huge for us early on, I just would start these affinity based groups with my neighbors, just me and my neighbors. And what really made a huge difference for our community was when I started to include one or two guys from our faith community in that, who I knew would connect well, that that made all the difference. So if I, I would just expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's uh, stop recording and then we'll have the last 15 minutes for questions.